start with the panel. First of all, uh, any questions for the panel? Let me start with one thing, because something I really like about uh, this setup is we get people from different communities. We have some database people and stuff like that. I learned a lot from the database talks. What do you found from the uh, the other side of the talks why, uh, why in, uh, for the database people? Is there something interesting that, uh, that uh, came out of other, other things? Uh, so I actually have to brush up on my related work in uh, your community. That, so I've seen things on lossless compression, for example. Uh, in the initial talks, I've seen uh, some of the uh, hybrid relational uh, linear algebra, which is closely related to many of the uh, works we are repeatedly reviewing that we are working on in our groups. And sometimes we are too narrowly focused on related work in our own field. So I, I think it's it's... Uh, it's very inspiring to look broader in terms of religion. Yeah, so I <coughs> I also like the, especially the talk by Amir, where uh, he tries to connect the uh, the PL community, the knowledge there, and the relational database things. Um, so, for example, I'm from the deep, uh, database community, and uh, a lot of the talk, uh, techniques there um, can also be seen as some techniques in the in the PL, like for mm -hmm. matrix uh, multiplication. Um, it's very nature in database. We just represent it uh, sparsely by by keeping the index of them and mapping to the value in it. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's just nice to have. Yeah. I mean, do you want to say something? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so if I want to be negative, I'm academic homeless. If I want to be positive, <laughs> I have several academic homes. So I was kind of <laughs> uh, already following the, yeah. the related... Yeah, you're on both I sides anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think... Uh, uh, but So one, one thing is that there are some techniques in, in databases that are kind of not... It, it's being somehow rediscovered uh, in the... So in the functional language community especially, but also in the high performance community. So I think the, the talk on incremental v-maintenance, so for example, I've seen some recent work actually on the sparse tensor algebra work that basically is doing something similar, but I think that there, there are many things that uh, still can be learned from there. Basically relations, uh, so the formulation that uh, it w was given, basically they were like tensors. Okay, so n array relation is an n minus one array ten, uh, order tensor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th there are many techniques. Uh, so re there are recent developments in databases, for example, on worst case optimal joints, which are basically kind of w w what you were saying about uh, uh, the SPDMM, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was basically rather than considering binary operators, we can consider like more kind of hybrid operators. Uh, so th this has been kind of based on theoretical foundations. It has been discovered in in databases, and I'm seeing actually more <laughs> work that <laughs> is trying to connect the, these two work. Okay. Yeah. So let me also turn the question to Olivia. You are probably the only architect in here. So what should uh, PL community learn from architects? What should the uh, sparse community learn from the architects? Did you find some anything interesting coming from that community that that can influence uh, other other direction? Yeah, I think it goes both ways. So I know Saman earlier this morning said that architects don't really care about programming <laughs> their system. That's actually not the trend in architecture anymore. I think that was the case back uh, when Moore's Law was booming. But now the way you really get people to use your accelerators is through the programming system and the software stack. Um, and so that's how architects kind of can learn from PL. I think the way the PL community can learn from architecture um, is it's part of this optimization like performance optimization and very like detailed approaches are necessary. Um, and so sometimes I think the PL community oversimplifies a lot of the problem and oversimplifies um, kind of how hard it is to build hardware, right? And so they'll say, oh, oh we don't want to build the hardware. Oh, th or they'll say, oh, we support these optimizations, but it's not the optimizations that the hardware community uh, has used for years and cares about. So yeah, it, it goes both ways. So um, we have both database folks and, uh, and people with hardware background on the panel. And uh, there was a time in uh, databases where people are building hardware for databases. And that seems to be coming back a little bit. Uh, should, we, should we be building hardware for databases? And I'll add, uh, I remember five years ago, 10 years ago, I was uh, 
in that talk where Michael Stonebreaker was heavily uh, ranting about no hardware in databases. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. So when when I just graduated back in 2011, I interviewed at two places: IBM Research Almaden in San Jose and Oracle Labs. And the project I would have worked on at Oracle Labs was the Rapids project, which actually built a, <laughs> a kind of database machine again. And ultimately, I was talking uh, one or two years ago with Eric Settler, and he simply made the point uh, that if you're building custom hardware, it's not this one-time effort, but you have to keep up with the mainstream development, which is a huge investment. And if ultimately you get an end-to-end -end performance improvement of 2x, it's simply not worth it having a village of people actually working on it. So it's ultimately an economic measure, I believe. So if you find a sub-kernel that's orders of magnitudes more expensive and the bottleneck, then it's worth building hardware. But uh, in data management, we have so many different uh, operators and kernels that you can't find this one single little piece. So I'm not sure if it's Th there's no matrix multiplier, I guess. Uh, that's what they found yeah. in machine learning. Yeah. I, th I think there's been a resurgence of, so some of the ideas that I presented about these reconfigurable arrays is a resurgence from uh, the very long ago architecture. So there, again, like the database community, have been ideas that, you know, had been brought up and then lost and then are now coming back because the workloads are changing. And so, again, something that Saman said is, like, if you target this generality, then maybe the performance cost is okay because you can then keep expanding the space of the domain that you're working on. So it, it's kind of been a shift in, in mentality, but we have yet to see, you know, if this will work in production. The other thing is that a lot of hardware ideas in the architectures, maybe you don't build the end-to-end -end system, but the ideas from these, like, architectural subunits have been making their way into production, like the TPU, the MTIA, right? They have the sparse cores. They have these uh, indirect memory lookup fetches. So um, it's, not, it's often not about the full end-to-end -end hardware. It's about the ideas that come up and then go into a mainstream hardware. So I guess to, to continue along this line, so I'm curious, um, think about bandwidth and compression and hardware and it's sort of from what I was talking about earlier, what really matters here? Where, where is it cutting close to the bone um, in a sense? Like what, what aspects of SAM and uh, the Onyx uh, construction for Olivia are is this bandwidth bound, or are you looking at workloads that aren't? Where you know where is the tension there? I think also from Matthias on compression for databases. Wondering if you can chat about if there's anything productive there. So uh, one thing that I did not touch on is that the utilization of our array for the sparse applications is actually very very low um, because the sparse kernels are. Uh, their kernels, right? So our array da is more performant when things are fused or you have mul like multiple inputs, uh, multiple cascaded uh, eins like einsums. Um, and so that is something that, that we need to look at. So I, I think we reach about like 1% of peak when we're running our sparse applications. But the th that wasn't really the problem we were trying to solve. The problem we were trying to solve is that, okay, no such system exists. So now that we have these numbers, how can we get to what you were talking about, Gilbert, with like the utilization and figuring out, okay, how do we actually integrate the sparse and the dense side? And how do we actually use the dense hardware well and the sparse hardware well? So I think those are open questions that still need to be solved. Uh, so for lossless compression, we have seen great successes in the sense where uh, the compressed representation actually, uh, if we look at what we could have achieved with a sparse or dense representation, uh, went far beyond uh, essentially peak bandwidth uh, uh, bounds. Uh, so in that sense, compression helped really push the boundary there. Uh, but I think nowadays we are in a in a decade uh, of specialization in many, many different dimensions. So my PhD student who followed up on compressed linear algebra, uh, instead of having four different encoding schemes, we currently have 350 uh, for all sorts of specific characteristics, data types, dictionary sizes. And uh, I think that combined with new data types that you see in the hardware accelerators with different ratios of having exponents for a certain range, but in various forms of precision, um, 
automatically exploiting that uh, has huge potential still that is untapped right now. Um, uh, I think people are good at optimizing for the common case, but as we get more and more specialization, we need to think about new abstractions and then really pushing this down. And compilation, in my opinion, is one way toward that, uh, but there are other other kind of microkernel approaches and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add another dimension to the problem. So, so we are right now focusing on kind of some architectures that we have full control over. Uh, so there are also other architectures. I'm using double code. So, for example, the cloud environment. So what? Uh, so I think there are kind of another kind of abstraction layer also on top of hardware that we can consider, and similar problems arise there. So, for example, I don't know in AWS you have like the S3 layer. And then you have basically compression and decompression there. And perhaps we, you need to basically consider kind of the abstractions that are kind of sitting. I don't know whether they are like hardware abstraction. But, but perhaps the SAM could be a kind of a good abstraction for that as well. But I think uh, similar problems in a different scale also appear there. So again, the memory bandwidth shows up, but then it's going to be basically the communication that happens uh, across uh, different nodes. I just wanted to make the problem even more broad. <laughs> no. Other questions? Other questions? Uh, so, uh, so, um, so there's a, com a compilation of these sparse programming models, but apart from that in the database world, uh, Hyper and various other systems have started to bring uh, compilers for low-level code generator into uh, databases. And that seems like it's become more and more common. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that trend from the database side? Uh, and uh, where do you think it will go? Where is it going? So there are two uh, classical execution modes nowadays that are the state of the art. One is uh, vectorized, where you essentially take from a, from a column small little vectors that fit into your cache hierarchy and you pipe them through. There it's super simple to implement because you have just tight loops that you're implementing and you're composing, you're interpreting a plan, but piping through with those little vectors. And the o opposite is you have query compilation in a push-based uh, manner. and you're utilizing kind of the LVM stack and others. And uh, actually the two opponent groups uh, came together. So Peter Bonds was actually at the Humboldt uh, uh, Stiftung uh, professorship part-time at TU Munich. And he wrote, uh, wrote those really interesting papers of saying on the same footing and the implemented in the same system, we systematically compare the two things and found that, well, it depends. It's uh, uh, there are use cases where one outperforms the other, but generally they achieve similar performance. But what you see in practice is that both are applied. So there are large systems like uh, AWS Redshift that heavily depends on code compilation. There they have challenges though, uh, challenges again in the combination with specialization. So uh, they have lots of different uh, lossless compression schemes. And if you want to generate code for all those different schemes, it's a combinatorial explosion. You have to pre-build things. Uh, so they try to separate at certain boundaries to avoid this combinatorial explosion. So actually, I, my PhD thesis topic <laughs> was uh, on the kind of code generation for, for, for databases. And uh, so I totally agree with all, all the points that Matthias mentioned. I think one of the problems, uh, there are two main problems that actually to kind of integrating these code generation mechanisms in basically industrial databases. One is the complication of that. Of course, whenever you add a compilation component, it's, it's going to become more, much, much more complicated. But the vectorized engines are easier to, to maintain. The other thing is that the code generation time. So re the recent kind of research line in databases on this topic, so most of the problems were solved. <laughs> but uh, the interesting research problem is that, OK, you could have very large queries. And so whenever you have a vectorized engine, yeah, you're just going to interpret it and you're going to basically pass vectors in, in the stream. Uh, whenever you're compiling, you have to generate machine code from that. And basically, there are line of work on how to generate directly assembly code <laughs> from, uh, the, from the physical plans of databases. Yeah. 
just adding one, there are also hybrid approaches where uh, you try to get both uh, of, of those things by start interpreting, compiling in the background while the query is already running. Whenever this compiled version is ready, you swap them out and kind of get, if you actually process a lot of data, then uh, for the majority of the query, it's a really compiled query plan. And, and one other component that exists in databases, and actually, I, I so it, it was in Matthias's slides, and I don't, may, maybe I overlooked, I didn't see that much research in the kind of uh, program language and compilers world, is basically this kind of sparsity estimation or cardinality estimation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the actual hill in databases, basically. So it has been, it, it hasn't been properly solved yet the problem. So the kind of main technique that database systems are using, most of them the industrial ones, is basically you create histogram of your data. And uh, the challenge is that, okay, whenever you're joining, then how you would uh, basically propagate this information. So what is the kind of, you have to basically see what is the dependence of different attributes to each other. And uh, so because then you can, the choices, the, basically, the schedules that you choose are totally dependent yeah. on the size of the intermediate results that you would yeah. have. So I want to push that question to Olivia. So in SAM, are you doing anything about finding the cardinality, especially things like if you want to do like sparse left-hand sides? So currently, so in SAM, we do not we do not handle that. We have looked at like some data analytics for these sparse tensor data sets through uh, some of the work with Gilbert, but also some of the work through the AHA project where Onyx was taped out. And right now, we are also just looking at histograms. So this is a problem that it also exists in the sparse community, like regardless of hardware or not. Because if if I ask a question about uh, does this schedule make sense, and I ask Fred, and Fred, you know, knows a lot of things about sparse things, and he goes. I don't know, right? So you, uh, this is these are the open problems that we're trying to solve as well in in the sparse uh, compilation community. Yeah. So basically, Fred is the cost model. <laughs> 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 Fred doesn't know. Fred doesn't know. And, and says model. infinity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess with that note, uh, we will finish the panel. We'll thank the panelists. So we'll start off lunch. <laughs>